Thank you, sir, and I'd like to thank whoever put my name in the hat for this conference because I have thoroughly enjoyed what little I've got to hear of it, and uh, I just am glad to be counted as a part of a fellowship of this kind because this is my gang as far as my fellowship is concerned. And uh, I feel like I'm an old settler's week. I see some of my old college mates here, Dr. Parker and I were in school together, and Brother Folsom who sang for us, and Dr. Clifford Lewis here, and when we get together anymore, we have changed so much we hardly recognize each other, but we finally get around to it. And the pastor friends I've met here, like Brother Seidler and Dr. Wiersbe is here, and I see Don McClinic and others, with whom we've been in meetings in the past. And of course, to be in this church and fellowship with the membership here, this is my first opportunity. But I want to thank you, and I have been blessed, and I want to thank the speakers who have already blessed my heart. Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Our Father, we thank thee tonight for what has happened here. We thank thee for how thy truth has been upheld and set forth in such plainness and with such power. We thank thee for so many hearts that have been stirred and revived and uh, we thank Thee, Lord, that many people have made new resolutions to stand in this day, in spite of all the opposition, to stand. And we pray that before we close this service tonight and this conference, that the power of God will speak through us, and, uh, and may we this night, if it possible, Lord, if there's somebody here without a knowledge of Christ, may this service wind up with some person coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, for we ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. I have quite a subject, as you can see. The subject assigned to me was the subject of heaven and hell. Actually, when that was assigned to me, it took me back about, oh, nearly 35 years, about 35 years, because the first time I ever preached a sermon on hell, I didn't have enough material to preach a whole sermon, so I preached on heaven and hell. That was many, many years ago. And I don't know if the committee knew about that or not, and just assigned me enough territory so I'd have enough to say, but I want to say that they assigned me a, a subject that means the end of everything. Uh, everybody in this world is headed toward one of the, those two places as fast as we can go. When I was a boy, seven years old, over 50 years ago, in a little country Presbyterian church, seven miles south of Birmingham, Alabama, where I was raised, I heard an old Presbyterian preacher preach on hell. That night the Spirit of God convicted me of my sin, and I felt as guilty as any liar or thief or cutthroat that ever lived on the face of this earth. And I could see myself in the flames of hell. I could smell the fumes out of the pit. I could hear the screams of the dying, and I could see myself as a worm in the fire that's not quenched. And that night when he got through explaining this horrible future for those without Christ, and I was given a chance, I shot out of my seat as if there were a spring under me, and I ran straight down and fell on my face in front of that church and trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. All of my life since then, I've been doing everything I know how to keep people out of hell. I go all over this land just pleading with people not to go to hell. You know, this is a subject that you rarely hear discussed in most places today, uh, except as a joke. There are an awful lot of jokes told with this subject involved. Mr. Moody one time was having a conference in his school in Chicago. And after the evening meal, they were sitting around the table, fellowship. And a preacher told a joke involving the subject of hell. And Dwight L. Moody jumped to his feet like a shot and stuck his finger under that man's nose. And he said, don't you ever speak of that place, sir, unless you can speak of it with tears in your eyes. And Moody was right. I, Dr. Dale, the great English preacher, said, Dwight L. Moody was the only man I ever heard preach that I felt had a right to give an invitation to men to accept Christ because he never preached without tears 
This is a horrible thought. But it's one we have to face up to because of the truth of it. The preacher who avoids preaching on this subject doesn't do his congregation a good deed. He does them a disservice. If you went into a doctor's office and complained of a pain in your side, and the doctor examines you and says, think nothing about it. It's just a little gas pain. It'll pass away in a little bit. Just forget it and send you out of the office. And then as you walk down the steps or down the hallway, he calls his nurses together and says, see that man? I wouldn't be surprised at all to pick up the morning paper and read his obituary. Got the worst appendix I ever saw. If you could prove a thing like that on a man, you could put him in the penitentiary for malpractice. And there are thousands and multiplied thousands of preachers in this country that ought to be put in a penitentiary for malpractice in the pulpits. Because they're hiding from the eyes of people the truth. And we can blame the condition morally of this nation tonight largely upon the fact that the ministry has led people away from a belief in an eternal hell. You take a poll in any great ministerial association in this nation and you'll find that 75% of the preachers don't believe in this place anymore. And when the minister doesn't believe in it, you know the congregation is going to believe it. I don't have a sadistic nature that makes me like to preach on a thing like this. I don't like to preach on it. But if I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God and if I'm going to wave a red flag across the path of those who are rushing in this direction, whether they like it or don't like it, whether I'm popular or unpopular, I must stand as God's man and deliver the whole counsel of God to the hearts of people. And when there's no fear of hell, there's no fear of God before the eyes of the people. This whole breakdown in morality can be traced or lack of belief in this subject. I want to tell you if the American public believed that there was a judgment and believed that there was a hell, and if every church they went into, if they stuck their heads up, if somebody were hurling the thunderbolts of God's wrath at their heads, there'd be a revival break out in this land. But there are too many sanctuaries for them to run to, to hide from the truth, where it's never preached to them. When little old effeminate looking, with a little squeaky voice, preaching Jonathan Edwards, in his day when people believed this truth could take a manuscript and hold it so close to his nose that it almost touched it, and stand there and read sinners in the hands of an angry God and people would grab a hold of their seats to keep them sliding into the pit that seemed to open beneath them. That's when people believe something. But if you were to resurrect that man and bring him back to the biggest congregation in this nation tonight and let him preach that same sermon the way he preached it then, people not only wouldn't grab at their seats to keep them sliding into the pit, I doubt if they'd even lift their eyebrows. Because this... Subject is out of date. There's no question in my mind that more money is not being spent to try to disprove this truth. And more doors are being knocked on and more literature is being published to try to disprove hell than any other subject in the whole Word of God. And oh, how they work. Because they know if they can get you to be fast and loose about your belief in the future punishment of the wicked, they can cause you to lose yourself. Now, if there was one slight possibility that there was no such place, I'd be the first one to shout it to the ends of the earth. But the more I read this book, the more I study this book, the more firmly I'm convinced of the reality of this place. And I suppose one of the texts in the Word of God that explains the two things I want to preach about tonight more than any other text would be John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish heaven, should not perish hell, but have everlasting life heaven. And we see not only the great love of God, 
in giving his son that we see the tremendous justice of God in damning those who refuse his son in this one text. And so we have from heaven's heights to the lowest hair and the greatest contrast in the word of God explained to us in this verse that we're all so familiar with. Now I want to say a few things about this subject before we pass on to the one that we like. First of all, hell certainly is a certainty. God and the devil started a battle in the garden that's been raging across the centuries. And the devil denied what God said. And we found out in the garden that God told the truth and the devil told a lie. And through all the ages, it's been the devil's word against the word of God. And the way it was in the beginning, the devil always is the liar and God's always the truth. And God affirmed and declared in the garden some things that took place and the devil proved to be a lie. But the devil's agents are still peddling the devil's lies. And some of the things they try to catch people with when they try to prove that hell is not a certainty. They say, well, hell just simply means the annihilation of the wicked. You don't have anything to worry about because when it says destruction, it just means, or eternal, it just means for a certain period and then you disappear, so what difference does it make? Well, let me read some verses. First from Revelation 19 and the 20th verse. It says, Then the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that brought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. These both were cast into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. As far as I can tell, these are the only two men in the word of God who do not go by the way of the white throne judgment into hell. They go directly into hell. They seem to be the Enoch and Elijah of hell. But here are two men cast into the lake of fire. A thousand years later, in the 20th chapter of Revelation, in the 10th verse, a thousand years later, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, not where they were and were annihilated, not where they stayed long enough to get burned up. Where they have been for a thousand years and are still there. Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night. Forever and ever. In Matthew's Gospel, the 25th chapter, in the 46th verse. And these... Speaking of the ones on the left hand, shall go into everlasting punishment. But the righteous, the ones on the right hand, shall go into eternal life. Now somebody will come to your, your door with a bunch of very colored books and tell you that that word that says everlasting is only for a period. That God didn't mean forever. It's punishment just as long as it lasts. You ask that person if he knows anything about Greek. And he perhaps knows a little Greek, but he perhaps runs a restaurant. And if he's a truthful person, he'll admit that he does. Then you ask him, what does this next word mean, the word eternal, in relation to life? Oh, he'll say, that's forever. And then you ask him if he does not know that those words are identical. So God takes the same yardstick to measure the duration of heaven that he takes to measure the duration of hell, and the same yardstick he takes to measure the duration of his own throne. And if hell isn't eternal, heaven is not eternal, and even God himself is not eternal. And somebody has perpetrated a hoax upon us, and we might as well forget the whole thing. 
And if I can't prove from this book that hell's eternal, I can't prove anything from this book. Because the Bible either means what it says or it means nothing. And it says that hell is eternal. It's not purgatory. It's not going to some place and being punished for a while and then brought out and made perfect by fire and fitted for heaven. You imagine God scorching a person in a place called purgatory and fitting him for heaven and giving him a degree from hell and as an entrance into heaven. In the 16th chapter of Luke and the 23rd verse, we discover that this whole thing, this is cut out of the whole cloth where Jesus Christ in telling this story told us the opposite of that. And a person who goes to hell stays there, and a person who goes to heaven stays there, and after the silver cord is broken in this life, and a, t and a soul takes its flight, it takes it to one of two worlds, and there's no calling back or changing that destiny for eternity. And if God could fit us for heaven by fire, instead of by blood, then he was the greatest monster that ever lived on the face of the earth to put his son through the fires of the judgment of the cross when he could have burned us a little and if it is just for heaven. And in order for somebody to impugn the blood of Jesus Christ to teach such an awful thing, cut out of the whole cloth as a place of temporary punishment to fit somebody for heaven, doesn't fit in with a pattern of the word of God in one scrap of a place. <coughs> And then they say, well, all are going to be saved finally anyhow. So what difference does it make? Look at John 3 and see if all are going to be finally saved. In the 36th verse, this is Jesus Christ speaking. He said, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son of God shall not forever, or ever, or ever, or ever, shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him, and will abide, and will abide, and will abide. As long as the throne of God stands, his wrath will abide upon that soul that dies without Christ. Every lie that the devil has, every attack that he tries to make upon the reality of future punishment for the wicked can be answered so clearly and so simply from the Word of God that we know that hell is a certainty. The Word of God teaches it. If it teaches anything, it teaches that. But we have a bunch of squeamish People in this country today, you know, they think they're all heart and they're big tolerant people in God. There's such a great big goody something to them. They get all excited when you talk about people going to hell. W.P. Nicholson answered that one time in Ireland. He was preaching on the subject of hell and he had a sermon like nobody had on the subject. When he got through, a woman came dashing up to him and said, Mr. Nicholson, he said, yes, ma'am. She said, would you put, do you have any children? He said, yes, ma'am. Would you put your children in hell? He said, no, ma'am. She said, I'm glad to hear you say that. He said, why are you glad to hear me say I wouldn't put any of my children in hell? Because she said, you've just been up there talking about God putting his children in hell. She said, do you think you have a tender heart in your bosom than God has? And she thought she had obliterated Mr. Nichols. He simply said, lady, God wouldn't put any of his children in hell either. You see, no child of God will go to hell. But you're not a child of God until you know Jesus Christ. You're not a child of God just because he made you. And this fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man stuff crawled right out of the slimy pit of hell and there's not a word of truth in it or a rag of scripture to support it. And Galatians 3.26 said we become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now God wants to save everybody. 
God wants you to go to heaven. God has done all God can do to get you to go. And salvation has been provided at the cost of the blood of His own Son. But if you won't listen, and if you resist the wooing of the Spirit, and if you walk over His Bible and walk the blood of Christ under your sinful feet and stiffen your old stubborn neck and kick aside the red lights of a warning that God just heads hell about with and go to hell in spite of all of an infinite God can do to keep you out of hell, then you'll just have to go. And it'll be your choice and you'll be stuck with it forever. Second place, hell's a necessity. Man's nature demands that to be a hell. You take a bunch of sinners and try to put them in hell, and you'd make a uh, heaven, you'd make a hell out of it. And if a person will not be separated from his sins here, then he must be separated from God and he turned. God makes you fit for his kingdom by saving you. And if you will not be made fit for the kingdom of God, you wouldn't be happy there. Heaven would be a hell to a sinner. And he'd rather go to hell than to have to go to heaven in his sinful nature. And man's very sinful nature and his fleshly desires and everything else demands that there be a separation in eternity between those who are saved and those who are lost. So man's nature makes it absolutely necessary. Then God's justice demands it. Suppose a teacher had uh, 50 pupils in a room. 25 of them do everything that she says. They work hard. They bring in their papers and they give, take the examinations and they do everything she asks them to do. 25 of them don't crack a book. They won't go to the board. They won't bring in a paper. They do nothing. And whenever examinations are over and the papers are handed out to the consternation of the 25 that have obeyed the teacher and everything she said, they get exactly the same grade as the crowd that didn't do anything. Would that be justice? You know, people are trying to talk about the justice of God don't know what justice is. You might as well ask in a penitentiary if the people in there believed in penal uh, punishment as to ask a bunch of sinners what they thought about the justice of God. You can't find anything about God's justice from sinners. Sinner can't understand justice. His mind fell with his body, and he thinks crookedly, and he has no conception of what justice is. And if God let sinners go free, and let sinners be just as free as those who put their trust in his Son, then God would pull down his own universe. And if God doesn't have enough character to punish sin, then God isn't poor. And then the earth vindicates hell. You see more evidence of the hell around you than you see of heaven, if you look. You have a garbage heap, don't you? Do you have a garbage dump somewhere around the city? You can't let garbage fly around your streets. It has to be hauled off. Some places lately have been letting it lie around until it got pretty dangerous. But then all of a sudden, everybody gets on a move and says this stuff has to go. This city's going to be destroyed. We can't have disease in our streets and filth in our streets. And so the garbage has to be hauled off and you have a garbage dump. Hell's God's garbage dump. He can't have heaven cluttered up with sin. Nothing entereth that defileth or maketh a lie. And that city is so pure that not one taint of sin will be allowed. And the cluttering up of sinners and sin? Oh, no. You have a cemetery, don't you? When somebody dies, you can't keep them in the house. Nobody would want to be your neighbor with a corpse in the house. There's a law that makes you take them out there and put them in the ground and separate them from living people. And dead people can't go on existing with living people. They have to be separated. 
and in eternity. Those who have life in Christ will have to be separated from those who are dead in the trespasses and sin. You can't take a cemetery to heaven and expect it to be heaven. And earth itself vindicates the fact of hell. And then you cannot depend on the goodness of God as an assurance there's no such place. Some people have two gods, one in the Old Testament and one in the New. And they say, well, I don't believe in that God of the Old Testament. I believe in God of the New Testament. Where do you get the idea of the goodness of God? Do you get it from the Old Testament? And Adam and Eve sinned. And God banished them and put the world under a curse that's been groaning under ever since. Is that where you get an idea of the goodness of God? You get an idea of the goodness of God at the flood? When he flooded this earth with waters and eight souls floated away in an ark, and the, when the last strong swimmer sank beneath the waves of the deluge and a generation disappeared in judgment? Is that where you read of God's goodness? Or maybe it's Sodom. When two whole cities vanished in liquid fire, and three people were led to safety, and God burned them up. Is that where you read about it? Read about it when he marched his armies and destroyed nations, men, women, and children, and cattle, and everything down to the ground, and burned their city. Oh, but that's the God of the Old Testament. I believe in the God of the New Testament. Which one? The one that led his son down on a cross? The one that let, let his disciples be run through with swords and sawn asunder and boiled in oil. Oh, but I, I don't, I, I, I believe in the God of nature, do you? The God that sends tornadoes and diseases and icebergs. Where do you read about the goodness of God? I'll tell you where you read about it. It's the same place you read about the justice of God, and that's at the cross. And the only place in this universe that all the attributes of God have ever been brought into focus was at the cross. And there he was good enough to send his son to die, but he's just enough to damn every soul that refuses to believe. Now, for just a few moments, hell's horrible condition. The Bible has a list of what hell's like. First of all, it's fire. Now, people get to arguing about the kind of fire. I don't know. It's fire. The Bible says it's fire. You know, in the 13th chapter of Matthew, when Jesus was giving the parables, there was one parable in that series that he gave about the wheat and the tares and he interpreted every part of that parable except one part. And he said that the tares would be cast into the furnace of fire, brother, and when he explained the parable, he left it a furnace of fire. He didn't interpret fire to be something else. He left it as it was. The fire that we have here can punish this body, but it can't touch the soul. But the fire that will be there can punish the soul and not destroy the body. Whatever it is, it will be more horrible than anything we know of fire in this life. But it will be fire, the Word of God says fire. And don't go around and say that it might be this, it might, it, it might be, it is fire, the Word of God says fire. And when you hear somebody trying to dodge the issue on that, you know they're trying to move in some modern conveniences. Somehow or other, they're just a little uncertain as to where they're going to spend eternity and they want to change it up to suit themselves. It's a place of God and His company. Revelation 21.8 gives a list of the folks that are going to be there. There'll never be no godly mothers there. There'll be no saved gospel preachers there. There will be no godly deacons. There will be nobody to care. There will be nobody that loves. There will be nobody that 
to warn. There'll be nobody to do anything but to curse and abuse and, and hate and despise and envy. The place will be full of the offscouring of the centuries for eternity all dumped into hell. Be a place of eternal death, Revelation twenty thirteen. The person will be dying, dying, forever dying, and never able to die. The last thing the person will remember when he wakes up in hell is that death had his cold fingers clutched at his throat and he was trying to shake him off and escape him. And he'll wake up in hell and death will be his companion and he'll be dying and dying and dying for eternity. And the enemy that we'll get rid of when we get saved will be cast into the lake of fire with the sinners to plague them forever. It will be a place of unsatisfied desires, Luke sixteen twenty four. A person will have the desires, he'll have the cravings for things that he sold his soul out for in this world, but not one of them will ever be satisfied in hell forever. It'll be a crying for a drop of water to cool a parched tongue. It'll be screaming for unsatisfied desires with no satisfaction. It'll be a place of terrible stygian darkness. Jude 13. Darkness that you can feel. It'll be a place of awful remembrance. Luke 16:25. My God, what an awful thing to have. What a thing to have in hell. A memory. A memory of wasted chances. A memory of when the song was sung and your feet were almost in the aisle and you were almost persuaded. And every one of those opportunities will be painted on the walls of hell in liquid fire to haunt and to damn the soul forever. And I think the worst thing about it to me would be it's a place of no hope. Luke sixteen twenty six. I mean no hope. No hope. The sun's set. The stars and moon have disappeared. You're on a one-way street. There's no turning back. You've lost your last opportunity forever. And you know that throughout all eternity, you will have no other chance, no other hope, no other hope forever. Can you imagine the sound of a soul wailing in hell, lost with no hope for eternity? And it'll be suffering. If you're here without Jesus Christ tonight, you're on the scaffold of death. The cap of unbelief has been adjusted in one slender thread of the love of God at all that holds your soul out of hell. Just to stand by with an uncheese sword, begging for an opportunity to sever the cord and let the soul drop to its doom. And God's love restrains and restrains. But one day the Senate persists too long, and justice will have to be done. And just the sword will glisten and gleam in the sunlight. And the cord will be severed and that soul will drop to its fate. Turn. Sinner, turn. Why will you die? Jesus, your maker. That's you why. Now, if you'll trust the Savior, He's preparing a place for you. He's been gone for a long time, getting it ready. And we have a pretty good description of it in the Word of God, not, not a full description. Most of the things we read in the Bible about heaven are negative. If God could have told us all about the beauty of it, I think we'd all have been so anxious to have gotten there, we'd have jumped off something. And I don't know if he could have trusted us to go on through, if we'd have known, and if we knew all that's going to be there for us. But we're saved from hell. 
Thank God save to heaven. Let me say just a few words about this and we close. This city, you know, the world's always dreamed of a perfect city. Men have written poems about it and, and men have tried to build every city perfectly. Washington, D.C., they thought was going to be a perfect city. That, that came a cropper, didn't it? Every time they try to build a city, they think this is going to be it. They've called them Zion, Utopia, Shangri-La. You know, this world hasn't seen a perfect city. I'm sorry to tell you, Pastor, but Cincinnati isn't perfect. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I know Amen. Brother Rollins is going to be cat, down cat. Detroit isn't either, Brother Vic. <laughs> St. Petersburg even isn't even perfect here. <laughs> and I have to admit, reluctantly, the Chattanooga isn't either. As long as something goes wrong with the waterworks, as long as something has to be improved about the streets, as long as uh, the lights go out, as long as there's a cemetery, as long as there's a police force, as long as there's a funeral parlor, you don't have a perfect city. But Jesus is working on one right now. The city he's building is four, about 1,400 miles square, wide, long, high. That's a four-square city. The city he's building has foundations, a foundation of precious stones. Now, if there's anything in the world a woman likes, it's some little old shiny rock or something. I didn't know until I had a little girl born into my home that a girl is born and it starts itching right there about when she's two years old. And it'll never be happy until there's a little shiny thing right there on that thing. My wife and I can be walking down the street and we come to a little old jeweler window about that wide and a little old carrot diamond. Oh, she's a And I, you know, big deal, carrot diamond. I've been in the Tower of London on different occasions. I've seen the crown jewels of the British Empire, that diamond in that mace as big as a hen egg, largest cut diamond in the world. And I've seen all those shiny stones and all that hardware that keep them in, and I walked around that thing. They said if anybody touched that cage, they used to have the things in up there in the tower. If you just touched it, they said the doors were closed automatically. The place was filled with tear gas, and soldiers would come running with Tommy guns. I didn't touch it. I just looked at it. <laughs> and I looked at them, and I said, boy, if they'd let me knock all that stuff out of the hardware they're in, I could take every one of them and stick them in my pockets and walk out of here with them. And people come from all over the world to look at the precious stones called the British crown jewels. Well, the city my Lord is building, 1,400 miles square, and the whole foundation is precious stone. You wait until he brings that down out of the skies, flashing, scintillating in the sunlight. This world never saw anything like they're going to see when he brings that city down. The street of that city he's building is gold. Not streets. All these songs that talk about the golden streets, you better cut out some of them because there isn't but one in heaven. Just one main street and nobody living on the main drag and throwing his garbage in the neighbor's front yard. Boy, everybody's on main street in heaven. No side street, no second street. It's all one street. And it's gold. I remember old Dr. Bob Jones one time preaching the chapel and he took out a little change like this. And he said... Suppose you could save up a little gold here. Take it to heaven with you. You're walking down the street and you meet an angel and you say, Hey, look, look, look what I brought with me. And you say, What's that? Gold, look, that's gold. Angel will say, That's asphalt. <laughs> We walk on that over here. <laughs> Walls of Jasper. Gates of Pearl. 
And a lot of prayer leaders comes from a wound. Those pearly gates speak of the wounds. In the hands and feet and side of the Son of God, and the only entrance into that city is by the way of the cross and the blood of Jesus. Amen. Nothing go wrong with the lighting system. Because the sun's going to be the light and his beauty will never fade. You won't need any street improvements. Nothing go wrong with the waterworks because there's going to be a crystal river bursting from beneath the throne of God forever. And nobody will get sick because there'll be a tree of life there, a tree there by the river of life. And he'll say, you for the health of the nations keep everybody well. There'll be some doctors there, but the services won't be needed. Won't be any funeral processions because nobody will die. No farewells. No nights, no tears. None of the things that cloud our sky and bring sorrow to our heart in this life in that city forever. The first pang of pain that I ever felt in my heart was when I was a little, little tiny boy. Five, I guess. The doctor came to see us, and I never... When a doctor came out in the country where we live, somebody was sick. We couldn't afford one. And my little sister was sick. Twenty-two months old. And the doctor stayed. And then that was serious. One morning, about 3.30 in the morning, I was awakened by something. And I sat up in the bed and I looked around and there's an old fireplace in the other room and the light shining through the door, flickering fire, and I saw my mother's form bent over an old trunk. And I heard her sob. And she sobbed. I've never heard my mother cry. Never. And I sat bolt upright and I said, Mother, what's wrong? And through the darkness came those words. Little sister died a while ago. And I said, Death. Death, what have you done? And I followed that little buddy and I stood holding to a mother's skirts and watched her wet her grave with her tears. Thank God in heaven, no tears, no death, no separation, no sighing. It all's done forever. And all the redeemed of the Lord will walk the celestial city, the street of that city, with one song of everlasting joy on their lips, and they'll sing His praises forever. But wait a minute. He's going to finish that up one day and bring it down, but he's fixing that city for folks who let him fix them up for it in this life. The difference in where you spend eternity, heaven or hell, hinges upon what you do personally with Jesus Christ in this life. Refusing. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned forever. And belief in Christ means heaven, and disbelief in Christ means hell forever. You shouldn't have too hard a time making up your mind which one of these places you want to live in. And if I were you, I wouldn't take any foolish chances. And if I'm not ready for heaven, I'd get ready right here before I left this service tonight for coming to Christ.